Good morning. Hey, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, there's a, uh, it's on page 650, or 552 on uh, the Bible down by your feet. If you need a Bible, we'd love for you to follow along and read out Matthew 6 and Matthew 25 here in just a few minutes. And, um, you know, as we uh, think about Thanksgiving this week, and I, um, I'm not sure if uh, this article I wrote for the pastor's pen was in the paper yesterday or not, but um, I was just thinking about uh, those that are alone and, um, you know, just thinking about this year and things being different for some, similar to what we just saw in the video that we played. And um, if you're one of those people that just are alone and, you know, the holidays, uh, thinking about Thanksgiving and Christmas, they don't bring you a lot of joy because of maybe some sorrow or feeling alone, I just want to remind you that in John chapter 15, Jesus says that he wants to be your friend. I remember one of the loneliest times of my life when I was a sophomore in high school and I moved to a new, a new school in Valentine. And uh, I broke my leg the last practice of two days of football. Uh, school was starting the next day. And uh, I went to school uh, with crutches and um, my, my entire leg in a cast that was bent, um, trying to navigate through a high school, not knowing anyone. New church, new school, no friends. And uh, I remember um, going to bed at night, several nights in a row, and just being really lonely. And I know that's how some of you are, that there's, there's a place in life for some of you that you're just lonely, and you don't have the companionship that others do, and it's, it's, a, it's difficult. And, and I just want to tell you, you know, on a, on a very small scale, I can relate to you, because that, what I went through is nothing compared to what some of you go through. But I was, uh, I, I remembered um, really crying out to God several times when I would go to bed, and uh, would put some music on, and I would... Uh, read my Bible, and I would cry out to the Lord, and I remember this moment, the moment where Jesus just said in my heart, he just told me, I'm with you. I remember when he said, I'm here with you, Mitch. And I went through two years of not having great friends. I had a couple good friends, but had some difficulties the two years I lived in Valentine um, for a few different reasons, but I remember like walking down the sidewalk and just feeling like Jesus was right there with me. It's when he became my best friend. And you could be married and be very lonely. You can have family and be very lonely. Because ultimately the only person that can fill the depth of the void in your heart is Jesus. The rest of us, we're all imperfect. <laughs> we're as great as a man I am, <laughs> I'm going to let you down. We're, we're all imperfect, and no person is going to fulfill what God really wants to fulfill in your heart and your life. And I just want to pray for you before I get into the Word today, that if, if you're in that place of loneliness, I want to pray that this week you have an encounter with Jesus. You've maybe known Jesus all of your life, but I want to pray that you have an encounter where he becomes your best friend. Father God, I thank you for your great love. In this week of Thanksgiving, and I, I thank you, as, as Chris shared, for the salvation that you've given us. But I thank you that you've given us so much more than a hope for eternity. You've given us life in the present. And Father, for some in the room, we've gone through hurt and disappointment and brokenness. There's a place in our hearts that ha feel abandoned and lost and lonely. Jesus, you declared in your word that you're our friend. Such a great friend that you laid down your life for us. You declared that you are our friend. So Jesus, I ask you this week, there are some that are desperate in this room for companionship. I'm so thankful for the friendship that you dropped in my heart that sophomore year of high school that really radically changed my life. 
And I ask you this week, God, that there would be those that are lonely, that as they seek you, that they would find you, and that they would find friendship beyond anything they could ever imagine. Jesus, will you be you? Strengthen those that are hurting and lonely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, that wasn't on the agenda. And uh, <clears throat> I was going to start this message uh, singing a song, but it doesn't seem like it fits right now. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22 says this, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. A broken spirit dries up the bones. And that's what we were just talking about with some of us in life, where we can have a broken spirit, it dries up the bones. But a joyful heart is good medicine. Joyful heart is good medicine. Say that with me. My joyful heart is good medicine. It is. I want to share that with you about having a joyful heart as I set the stage today because I want to talk about joy in finances. Some of you got it. Some of you got it. Listen, money is such a divisive conversation that I wanted to make sure joy is the foundation of who we are as we dive into a few things about money. But here's my goal, that we could develop hearts of joy in our finances. And I'm going to preach a message today uh, that I'm preaching to myself, really. Uh, but before we jump in to uh, shed some light on some things regarding money, I just want to remind you that everyone in this room, every single one of us, every one of our situations regarding finances are different and unique. Look at your fingerprint. I know you really can't see it. You're, everybody's, everybody's financial situation is unique as your fingerprint is. You're the only one that has that fingerprint, and I want to tell you every situation, as similar as they might be, or different, or unique, everybody's is unique. All our situations are different, and nothing is the same. But we do all have one thing in common. We have this thing in common that money is an important part of life, that it's a sustaining part of life of how we function. It doesn't matter how much you have or, or how much you think you need more, at least it would, it would seem that, that way. It doesn't matter because billionaires seem to only want more. <laughs> Everybody seems to be striving to get more. It doesn't matter how much you have. And we're all living in different situations. Some are struggling day to day to put food on the table. So, some, some of you in the room, I know, you're struggling every day just to put food on the table. And some of you are struggling to pay the rent. And some are struggling with medical bills. And some are worrying about the future. Listen, money is not evil, but there is a spirit behind money called mammon that wants to control you. It wants to control you. And we all struggle with a little bit of this spirit of control, whether you have a little or you have a lot. We all struggle with the money that's in our hands. I want to read to you out of Matthew chapter 6. Jesus shares a couple things about God and possessions. And uh, we're going to read Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, since, he either, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. In these set of verses, Jesus shares about God and possessions. Now, I want to share you maybe, with you maybe three things that Jesus said. The first thing that Jesus said, he started talking about, is treasure. The first thing he talks about is treasure. What do you think about when you think about the word treasure? How many of you, like me, think of an old box full of gold coins that some pirate has found somewhere? <laughs> Maybe you think about something old, like antique, that in its age it has developed worth and is a treasure. We have a treasure hunter in our midst, Jason Combs, and uh, I've done a treasure hunt with him, where we went to somebody's house and 
went through buildings, and I've never seen a man so excited to dig through junk and rubble, <laughs> piles of clothes and Tupperware to find a treasure. He risked his own life as we climbed up on this pile of stuff that was moving. It was amazing. He was a treasure hunter. I'll never forget that experience. Treasure's worth getting. Maybe when you think about something about treasure, maybe you think about something new, something that is fresh. Maybe it's a new car or a new phone or a new house, and it's a treasure. Maybe it's something memorable, something that has intrinsic value because it means something to you, and, be, and it's become priceless. And there is no dollar amount that you would sell it for. Maybe that's a treasure to you. Jesus says two things happen when we store our treasures on earth. He said they sit hidden somewhere out of sight, sometimes because we're fearful. We hide it. We have this treasure, but we hide it because we're afraid that somebody's going to come and take it. And when we hide it, moth and rust will destroy them. You know, Nebraska's not the best environment to store our old cars and keep them from rusting. The weather here, it wants to rust, and the treasure will lose its value if you don't store it properly and take care of it. And Jesus also shares that when you have a treasure that others know about, somebody is going to want to get it. If you won the lottery today, everybody would want a piece of your treasure. Most lottery winners, for whatever reason, are broke within like, I don't know, four years, four or five years, they've spent it all. Thieves want to break in and steal it. Basically, Jesus is saying that those things here on earth that have value will one day lose its value due to the elements of the world, or someone else will want to come and take it from you. So Jesus says, store up your treasures in heaven. And he's talking about things that don't have temporal value, but rather things that have eternal value. And he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, to store up heavenly treasures. Matthew 13, we read this a few weeks ago, this parable where Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and then reburied, moved it. Then in his joy, I found the treasure. He went and sold everything that he had so he could buy the field and take claim of the treasure. The kingdom of heaven is worth all that you have. The kingdom, the salvation that God has offered you is worth more than all the temporal things here. It's worth selling all that you have to go get that treasure. Jesus talks about treasure. The second thing he talks about is the eye. You ever heard the statement, keep your eye on the prize? What's that mean? It means don't lose your focus. What are you focused on? Are you focused on what you can gain what you can gain financially to have earthly significance in the eyes of others that others would esteem you in one way or another? Or are you focused on what you can give to have heavenly significance in the eyes of God? What you can gain or what you can give. Jesus said if your eye is good, your focus, what you're focused on, the why behind the what, why I need money, if you're focused on eternal things, your eye will be good and full of light. But if your, buy, if your eye is bad, if your focus is about temporal things, you will be full of darkness. Proverbs 20 verse 13 says, don't love sleep or you will become poor. Open your eyes and you'll have enough to eat. What he's saying here is that you do need to go and work and God will provide for you. Don't leave sleep. Don't be, a, don't be, don't be just, just sleeping your life away. You'll be poor. Open your eyes. God set something in front of you so that you'll have enough to eat. There's something for you to do. Proverbs 4.25 says, let your eyes look forward. Let them look forward. Now listen, some of us, our finances, the things we've been through in life, we're constantly looking back, back about the mistakes we made, what we don't have, the, the th places where we've lost money, all that kind of stuff. And if you're looking back all the time, you'll never get to what's ahead of you. Let your eyes look forward. Fix your gaze straight ahead. In other words, forgive yourself for those mistakes. Repent of them and move forward so that you can do the things God's called you to do. Psalm 25 verse 15 says, my eyes are always on the Lord for he will pull my feet out of the net. He will pull me out of the trap so that I can move forward with him. My eyes are on the Lord. Where are your eyes focused when you think about finances? 
Are your eyes on what other people think and what other people are doing, or are your eyes focused on what God is asking you to do? You can gain great advice from other people. You can, you can learn from other people's situations. But what is God asking you to do with your finances? The third thing Jesus says is that you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. He said you cannot serve both God and money. You can serve God and use money to do that, but you cannot serve money and have a heart to serve God. You can serve God and use money, but you cannot serve money and have a heart to serve God. Only one can be your master. Only one can rule your heart. And so I want to share a few things about joy and finances, and then I want to come back to Matthew 6 in a few minutes. But, so just maybe hold Matthew 6 and flip to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. There's a parable that Jesus shares. How can I have joy-filled finances in my life and in my home? I want to read this parable out of Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14. See something that sticks out? Underline that, highlight that. Here's what Jesus said. For it is just like a man to go out on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and another one talent, depending on each one's ability. A talent was a sum of money, most likely a year's wages. So to one he gave five, one he gave two, and one he gave one. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more, but the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man, had received five ta- the man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will put you in charge of many. Share your master's joy. Share your master's joy. Verse 22, the man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Verse 24, the man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You are a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, You evil, evil, lazy servant, if you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited money with the bankers, and I would have received my money back with interest when I return." So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw his good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus shares this parable about the talents. The one who has five, and he goes and earns five more, and he says, well done, good and faithful servant, share in your master's joy. The one who had two servants, two talents, went and and multiplied those talents, and he had two more talents. He said, well done, good and faithful servant, share in your master's joy. And the one who had, had one talent was simply afraid. And I think a lot of us in life, unless we have achieved someplace, and even if you have, Sometimes we feel like we're just afraid when it comes to money. We're just afraid. And because we're afraid, we hold on with closed fists. And we don't use what God has given us so that we can have that multiplied in our life. We don't go invest and work hard and put those things. Some of us don't. Some of us hold on and we're more concerned about the past than we are about the future and how God's going to help us get there. I want to share... um, five things with you, heart attitudes to be a five-talent person. I don't know how many God has given you. The first thing you have to do is take the heart of judgment off. What does that mean? Well, take the heart of judgment that somebody else has more than you do, and you're just mad that they have more than you do. They've been given more talent. Some have just been given more talent, and they've done well with the talent that they've had. It's not about what others have. It's about what God has given you and what you're doing with it, what he's given you. 
And so I want to tell you, here's the first hard attitude to have joy-filled finances, and it's thankfulness. Listen, you'll never have joy-filled finances, no matter how much you have. Whether you make $20,000 a year, $50,000 a year, $100,000 a year, $200,000 a year, you'll never have joy-filled finances if you don't have a heart of thankfulness. Thankfulness is what will help you use what God has given you effectively. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. What I have, not what I don't have. If you have one or two talents and you live your life comparing and criticizing those who have five talents, you'll live in misery no matter how much you have and you'll be stuck. If you have five talents and you live your life criticizing those who have one talent, how they should be living their life differently, but refuse to build relationships with them and help them with their talents, you'll be stuck. Where is your focus? Where is your eye? Is it on what's in your hand, or is it on the Lord? Is your eye on the temporary treasure, or is your eye on the eternal treasure? Is it on the Lord? Heavenly eyes lead to thankfulness for what I have, whether I have a little or a lot. You, you will be joy-filled. And I see people, I know people, who have less than I do, and they have way more joy than I do. And I know people that have more than I do, and they have way more joy than I do, because their eyes are heavenly. Heavenly. A thankful heart leads to the second thing, which is a generous heart. A generous heart. Generosity. When I serve God... I freely give because I respond to the Holy Spirit. If, if my eyes are here, I'm going to be like this with it. But if, in my treasure, if I'm heavenly focused, I'm listening to the Holy Spirit to say, what do you want me to do with what I have here? How do you want me to respond with this that I have? A thankful person is a generous person. We understand who the source is and where it came, came from. Are you closed-fisted, just holding on to it so tightly that it squeezes out, or are you open-handed saying, God, what would you like me to do with what you've given me? Whether it's $1, $10, $100, what do you want me to do with what you've given me? Proverbs 29, verses 2 through 4 says this, When the righteous flourish. Now listen, are you righteous? Yes, yes Jesus has made you righteous. If you have trusted God, if you've put your heart in, in Christ Jesus, Jesus has made you righteous. You have become righteous. When the righteous flourish... The people rejoice when the righteous. There are people rejoicing today because the righteous are flourishing. The body of Christ in America alone provides more financial resource in the mission field than our nation gives to all the other nations in the world. It's a staggering number. The missionaries and the missionary dollars from the righteous people in America lead to much rejoicing around the world. There's people rejoicing today in Honduras because you support Grace Fellowship Church who supports Honduras. There are people rejoicing all over the world because of the flourishing that has happened in our midst. When the righteous flourish, the people rejoice, but when the wicked rule, people groan. A man who loves wisdom brings joy to his father, but the one who consorts with the prostitutes destroys his wealth. If you have wisdom, you bring joy to your father. By justice, a king brings stability to a land, but a person who demands contributions demolishes it. So are you concerned with what you can give, or are you concerned with what you're owed. I have people that owe me money. They've owed me money for a long time. But if I'm concerned about those that owe me money, I will not be joyful. But if I'm concerned with what I do have in my hand and what the Holy Spirit wants me to do with that, I can be joyful. Are you concerned with what you can give or what you're owed? A, a joy-filled heart a joy-filled finances heart is one that has a thankful heart, a generous heart, and one that has a heart of stewardship. Of stewardship. What's that mean? That means that you have learned to manage your fleshly desires and you have self-control. 
I know, every time I go to the gas station, I would like a bag of chips, a soda, and a candy bar. <laughs> and I used to do it that way. I used to. Until I realized I wasn't being a great steward on that seven, eight bucks I was spending every time I went to the gas station. I didn't need any of it. I was trying to fulfill something in my flesh that my flesh didn't even need. Stewardship has to do with reigning in my flesh, learning how to, to be appropriate with what I have, but also not spending what I don't have. In other words, sometimes we, we spend to try to catch up with what everybody else has, and we find ourselves in a place of misery. Many people live in poverty because they can't differentiate between these two words, needs and wants. Needs and wants. There's a big difference between those two, needs and wants. And God says he will provide for all of your needs. He'll provide for your needs. I got a lot of wants. I got a lot of wants. I shared this story several months ago, and some of you have been asking me, um, about waiting on the Lord and how hard it is to wait on the Lord. And so I shared the story about totaling my van, Good Friday, after our wonderful Good Friday service down at the Eunice Center with 1,700 people, driving home at 9.30 at night, passing Little USA, going down the hill, and boom, I hit something that I thought was a person on a bike. I didn't see it at all. I thought I hit a person. I had this, man, grief and, I mean, agony in my heart immediately because I thought, what did I just do? And I pulled over, and I got out a little bit shaking and this car had pulled over behind me, and this young man that knew me said, Mitch, did you see that deer? And relief came to me. <laughs> relief came to me. And uh, I did not see that deer that totaled my van. And so I could have went out and bought a new vehicle that week, and the Lord said, I want you to wait till October. I said, wait till October. So I've shared the story with you, and many of you are like, okay, it's November, Mitch, what happened to your vehicle? Have you got one yet? What'd you get? What'd you get? Can't wait to hear what you got. Can't wait to... I can't wait to hear what I got either. So <laughs> beginning, of, beginning of October, I started looking for, end of September, beginning of October, I started looking for vehicles. I didn't even know what I wanted. Like, there's lots of, like, what do I need? What's practical? What, what do I really need, God, you know, for a vehicle? So I started looking, I tested up some different vehicles, but I had no peace in my heart. I, I still didn't have peace in my heart. Because I'm not going to go just do something to do it. I got, and I told him, I said, God, it's October. Like the first week of October. So show me what vehicle I should be getting. And I, there was nothing in my heart. I could afford to go get one. Had some money saved up. Was, was gonna, would, would be able to take out a small loan and do what I needed to do. And um, the week before we went on vacation, when uh, Catherine Ronaldo was here, um, uh, the week before that, it had gotten a little chilly. We went to turn on our, th our, our furnace, and guess what? Our furnace didn't turn on, which I knew was an issue from the spring that I hadn't dealt with. <laughs> Smart move, Mitch. <laughs> had him come, look at it, and I'd had him there a few times before, fixing pieces on this thing, and yep, sure enough, this part they can't find anywhere, called all over the nation, nobody makes it, blah, blah, blah. Got to get a new furnace. We don't give those away anymore, <laughs> especially since COVID. So I didn't get a new vehicle, but I have heat in my house. I want a new vehicle. I want a new car. I, I, want to, I, I just want to drive it. I got, I got vehicles I can drive. I'm just not like I'm not getting around. I got a, I got a 2001 Ford F-150, it's got 278,000 miles on it. It's getting around. Had a friend come and help me fix it, get it going again. I'd like a new vehicle. I want one. But I don't need one today. What I needed was a furnace. Thank God I was able to get a furnace. But I've been frustrated about that. Right? So we can all relate, right? I'm going to get a new vehicle sometime but not until the Lord says so. And I think that's the difference between looking here and saying, I want this, now I need this, versus God, what do you want me to do? What do you have for me? And the waiting is hard. Flesh doesn't like it. 
It's like passing up that Snickers at the gas station. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. No matter what you have, whether it's a little or a lot, in your eyes, it's, you probably feel like it's a little. No matter what you have in your hand, Use it as a good steward, steward it well, be thankful, and use it to serve others. How can I serve others? That doesn't always mean giving money to people, but how can I use what I have to serve others well of the very grace of God? A thankful heart, a generous heart, a heart of stewardship. And then the, the, the last one, I said five, I was wrong, four. The last one is this, is a heart to be free heart to be free from what? Proverbs 22 verse 7 says this, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. A borrower is a slave to the lender. I mean, we live in a perpetual crisis of financial slavery in America. Everybody wants to sell you something on credit. They want you to pay later. Sounds good today, but it doesn't sound good later. The borrower is a slave. You know, I, I want that noose off of my neck. I've been, I've been debt-free except for my house twice in my life. I've been through financial peace several times. We, we run the financial peace system. We do all those things. But there are things that happen in life that could put you back into debt. And um, one of those things that was unfortunate for us uh, a few years ago was medical bills that uh, insurance company did not pay for what they said they were going to pay for. And... Um, and that has been, that's what's owed to me that's been hanging out there that I already paid for that now I'm in debt to, right? And there was some other things that we were working diligently. The one thing I really was frustrated about my van was I had um, a, about six months of payments left on it. And then I'd already made the decision, I'm going to drive this baby for a while because that's what I was going to do. So that also is frustrating, right? Like, God, where are you? <laughs> he's got big shoulders. He's got big shoulders. So, you know, for me, though, but so I, I've been working diligently. My thought was in, from April to October, we're going to get this debt really taken care of. We're going to make a huge step forward, which we were making huge steps forward. And then I had my gallbladder surgery on August, which was another setback. And then we find out about the heater, which was another setback. And so I've had financial setbacks. So this whole month, me talking about joy and finances today over the last eight weeks, finances have been trying to rob my joy. Not because I don't have enough, because I have enough. But I don't want to be slave to the lender. I don't want to be a slave. I want to work hard to get that out. Because debt's like a noose around your neck. So what do you do? Will you get a plan... You ask the Lord to help you with a plan, and you put it into action, which for me meant less Doritos and less Snickers and less Pepsis. That was years ago. It also meant less golf. <laughs> Why? Because I want the noose off of my neck. Do you want the noose off your neck? I'd say it starts with being thankful with being generous, with being a good steward, having a plan. Psalm chapter 90, I want to share a couple of verses with you and then we're going to get back to Matthew 6. Psalm chapter 90, starting in verse 12, this is, this is a psalm written by Moses. And um, for, starting in verse 12, he says, teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Say wisdom. wisdom. And then it says this in verse 13. Lord, how long? Lord, how long for my finances? Lord, how long for my health? Lord, how long for this emotional baggage? Lord, how long? Anybody got a Lord, how long in your heart? Yeah. Moses had a Lord, how long? He says, turn and have compassion on your servants. God, give me compassion. 
Verse 14, satisfy us in the morning with your faithful love so that we may shout with joy and be glad all the days of our lives. How long, Lord? All right, give me your compassion. Satisfy me in the morning. This is not, this is an eternal quality he's talking about here. The, 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 the temporary things may not have changed, but Moses says, satisfy us in the morning with your faithful love, because love washes it all. Satisfy us in the morning with your faithful love, so that we may shout with joy and be glad all the days of our lives. We started out six, seven, eight weeks ago talking about joy and talking about having a shout for joy. Even in financial bondage and baggage and situations you did not put yourself in, but you happen to be in, can you get up in the morning, receive the love of God, and say, Jesus, and give a shout of joy and be glad all our days. It's a response to faithful love that's poured out in your heart. Verse 15, make us rejoice for as many days as you have humbled us for as many years as we have seen adversity. <laughs> make us rejoice all these days that I've been humbled, that I'm not in control. For as many years as I've seen adversity, God, I want to rejoice. Let your work be seen by your servants and your splendor by their children. Let the favor of the Lord, our God, be on us. Let the favor of our Lord our God be on us. Establish for us the work of our hands. See, there's a partnering with God. We are called to do something with our hands. Establish for us the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. Moses says, teach us to number our days carefully so we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Wisdom. Tony Evans says, life is like a coin. You can spend it any way you wish, but you can only spend it once. Establish the work of our hands through the wisdom that he has given you, submitting all that we are to God for the brief time we have. Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to finish. Matthew 6. We read about God and possessions, and on that, Jesus continues in verse 25 when he says this, Therefore I tell you, very familiar scripture, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. I mean, that all comes from our resources, right? Or about your body or what you will wear. Isn't life more? Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Aren't you worth more? Yes, you are. You are worth Jesus. Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wild flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spend thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more? Say much more. Much more for you. Even you of little faith. Won't he do much more? So don't worry saying what we eat or what we drink or what we wear. For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you want them, need them. He knows your needs. He knows your needs. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough of its own trouble. Come on up, Abby. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. How do you know if you're seeking the kingdom first? Where do you go for guidance? Where do you go? Who do you look to? For many Christians, he's the one we run to when all else fails. Instead, seek his perspective first. Dr. Tony Evans says this, I want to read this note. God's kingdom is lived out from the perspective of heaven, not earth. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Far too many Christians, though, think they can mix a little of God with a lot of the world. 
They're willing to follow several isolated fragments of what they find in God's word. Go to church for fellowship, give money when it's convenient, not stealing, and so on. But they're not willing to submit to God's comprehensive plan and purpose for their lives. They're not willing to be part of his kingdom agenda. That's a big problem because when you bring the world into the word, you're asking God the king to bless something that's contrary to his kingdom. He won't do that. In the end, your efforts to keep hold of only a little piece of God actually prevent you from experiencing any part of God because you can't operate in two kingdoms at once. You can't serve two masters. If you lose sight of the kingdom, God's perspective gets lost on you and you start focusing on the tangible and temporal things in life. When that happens, your judgment begins to be skewed and your decisions become short-sighted. Rather than living out your destiny and purpose, you may end up with wasted time, effort, energy, and emotions. But when God's kingdom is prioritized, you get to see heaven both rule and overrule in your life. You will witness God trump circumstances and people that you thought had the last word because only God has the last word. You'll get to experience him at a whole new level as you experience him as king. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. The seek first principle, whatever you seek is what organizes your life. If you seek to be free from pain, pain will organize your life. Everything, you, everything I got to do to, find, to try to be free from pain and pain's a difficult thing to not have organize your life. If you seek to be free from sin, sin will actually organize your life. It'll be all that you think about all the time. And then when you conquer that area of sin in your life, you become judgmental towards other people's sin in their lives. Whatever you seek is what organizes your life. When you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the kingdom of God will organize your life. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, most of us don't like talking about money. We don't want people in our business. We don't pe want people judging what we've done and what we haven't done. We want people judging what we have and don't have. Father, money, for whatever reason, is such a personal thing. And that spirit of mammon wants to grab a hold of our hearts and control us. It makes us fearful. It makes us insecure. It makes us hide. But God, I don't want to be fearful with what you've given me. I want to have an open hand, and I just want to hold it up to you and say, God, this is what I have. I'm your child. You said you would take care of, care of me. What do you want me to do? Lord, I don't want to be a one-talent person that's buried it. I want to be a one-talent person who's multiplied it because I've heard what you've said in my life. Evidently, your kingdom is about multiplication. It's pretty clear from the talents. I want to share in my master's joy. Father, right now, the spirit of mammon that's been over individuals in this, lot, in this room that's caused them to be fearful about finances, that's, that's caused them to be controlling, if that's you, man, right now I encourage you just to open your hand and say, God, it's all yours. I want to trust you with it. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we take authority over the spirit of mammon. It is not God-given. It is not kingdom-oriented. Right now, we take authority over the spirit of mammon. It has no authority over our lives. We yield it, and we surrender it to you, God. God, would you free us from the spirit of mammon and the spirit of fear? But would you help us to respond with hearts of giving, with hearts of thankfulness, with hearts of stewardship, with hearts of freedom that have moved towards you? God, we pray today, right now in this moment, Lord, that you would free us from the fear of finances, but we would step in with faith that you will lead us. And we don't want to be sleeping and slumbering. We want to be active. We want you to establish the work of our hands. So God, give us wisdom so we know what to do, God, with what you've given us. Lord, I don't know what, where you want me to be in life or society, but I want to be right where you want me to be, and I want to be faithful with what you've given me, and I want to be effective with what you've given me, and I want to trust you with it all. So God, would you help us so that we would not have sorrow-filled finances, but we would have joy-filled finances. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Come on, come on, Abby, sing for a minute. When I will make room for you, Jesus, to do whatever you want to, do whatever you want to. God, your way is better. Your way is better. Make that, break up that ground of our tradition, Lord. Lord, tradition has not brought freedom into my life. I don't want to live tradition. I don't want to live out of religion, but I want to live out of freedom with a heart that's surrendered to you. So God, we ask you, Lord, would you take our finances and break us out of ruts so that we could become effective and productive for your kingdom here on this earth, no matter how many days we have. We want to honor you with our lives and all that you've given us so that you would be glorified. And it's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, give God praise for his word today. If you want to, as you leave today, you can drop your connection card, your offering on the way out. If you'd like to do that, if you want prayer, there's going to be people down front to pray with you. And um, so be blessed. Have a tremendous day. Have a great day.